you attempt to correct something and within one or two weeks you make no real material changes, then it means you do not understand this problem well enough and your review process has not been thorough enough. You need to really take a step back and provide yourself more time to do a deeper analysis. And that can include trading mistakes too, right? You you think you understand this particular setup, but it just kind of keeps failing. And maybe it's because the market's changed or maybe because uh, you know, the, there's just something slight that has changed about the market or that there's something missing that you're able to access when you're in a better mental state that you can see that you're not able to access when you're in like a more normal B game state. Welcome back everyone to the episode on with uh, Jared Tendler, a good person that I was reading his book for multiple years. So Jared, it's good to have you on the podcast. Welcome on the podcast for sure. And good to have you here, of course. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. Good to, good to, good to be here. Uh, awesome. Really so I want to kind of start with, uh, I think you need no introduction. People know you from your books, but tell us a bit more about what you do these days and kind of what your work is around. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I call myself a mental game coach, right? I have a master's degree in counseling psychology. I combine that with sports psychology. So I can't call myself a psychologist because I don't have a PhD, but my work is really, you know, centers around the areas of performance. And I started working with golfers because I was a high level golfer in college myself and still play at a high level uh, today. Uh, but then I found like a niche in poker uh, 18 years ago, 17 years ago, and started working with professional pokers who were playing online and then wrote the mental game of poker uh, one and two. And in 2013, started hearing from traders who were picking up the poker book saying, well, look, if you change the word poker to trading, you basically have another book. I didn't do that um, and spent uh, you know about eight, nine years working with traders, uh, including some institutional traders, uh, some large funds. And, uh, you know, as well as, you know, independent retail traders, like probably many of you, most of your audiences, um, and then, you know, started working on a trading book that was far more tailored uh, to traders. But I've also worked with sports bettors. Uh, I worked, you know, with a, a world champion pool player. I'd say the majority of my clients are not the most athletic. Right? So it's it's kind of high level mental games where I, I where I tend to thrive and uh, have found a niche. That's interesting. So a lot of people would say that all training is simple. You just like press a button, you make money. How does that compare to other like golf or other sports or even poker? Is it like that different? You have to really focus on your mental game a lot or is it pretty simple? I think trading is far more complicated than most people think. Um, I, I think to, you can learn to place trades. You can learn to make money fairly quickly, but to be a trader, uh, you need at least several years of experience and skill in order to be able to do that successfully. So, you know, I think the basics of anything are fairly, you know, are, are that simple, right? You know, just get the golf ball in the hole, uh, win the poker hand, uh, you know, whether it's billiards or sports betting. I mean, you know, you can simplify anything, but the complexity lies because, you know, there is a lot of skill versus of people who have a lot of skill. I mean, you know, imagine um, I had $10,000 and I decided to become a trader. It's basically like me saying, oh, I've got 10 grand. Let me go enter a PGA Tour event. Let me go compete in the Premier League. I mean, there's a, a, a demand, I think, at this point to understand that the people that you're competing against, you know, in trading have been doing this for years, decades, and certainly the largest players in the industry have you know, nearly unlimited funds to help to systematize and and create uh, edges and opportunities in the market that others can't just do easily. So yeah, it's not simple. And that's, that's just the skill side. Now you've got also got like the mental and emotional dynamics, which all of us bring in, you know, both our kind of our personal desires, wishes, goals, flaws, biases, traumas, you know, past pain points, crap from childhood. Now I'm not saying that that is always what I talk about with my clients, but sometimes we go there and, and, and the traders that have sometimes the most difficulty doing the most basic tasks, like closing an order out at their target because they can't hold, sometimes it does actually have links to their inability to handle losing when they were kids and they just were rage monkeys and or they were you know paralyzed with fear about doing something wrong. They had massive expectations. So, you know, the complexity of our own psychology is you know, a, a massive player. And I think, you know, many traders really do understand that. But I think what I've kind of brought into the industry is a bit more of a systemization around how to actually improve it. Because I don't love the term mindset. And I know 
many people throw it around, you know, and, and the reason I don't like mindset is because it implies that there's something kind of static. Like we're all aspiring towards this ideal mindset in trading and poker and golf, but you would never say that, you know, that there was an ideal indicator or there was an ideal setup. Like it's too complicated you know, in trading for there to be kind of like one thing for everybody. And so, because in part as traders, as people, right, our goals and motivations, our skills change over time. So there's an ever evolving complexity with our psychology that you have to understand. So my system is not just about helping you to develop a better mentality, a better approach psychologically, emotionally, and mentally today, but learning how to kind of troubleshoot your, your, the issues and things you you come across, you know, throughout the entirety of your career. So, you know, that that I think is more important. Like learn how to get yourself in a good mental frame and then troubleshoot whenever you're struggling and allow yourself to continue to progress over time. When you have traders that might have some kind of level of skills that might be somewhat experienced in trading, but they don't make the money they want to make, what's the process you go through to help them to kind of get to the level they want to be in trading? First thing I ask is like, are you actually any good at this thing? Um, you know, and I've, I've had a number of inquiries recently. And I don't know why it's just kind of the, the trends that kind of come. I had three inquiries that I basically rejected because they weren't good enough. You know, I, I could tell just the way they were talking that they weren't skilled enough as traders to really get the most out of my my material. Um, you know, you, you kind of have to have a clear understanding about how your emotions are reacting uh, based off of, you know, your approach to trading, the, you know, the flaws and biases with which you're kind of imprinting or bringing into the market that's blinding you, that's altering your perspective to see opportunity when it's not actually there or to, you know, be fearful that you should be closing when you shouldn't uh, versus actually just not being skilled enough and really panicking. I'll, I'll give you an example, actually, from, you know, uh, chapter five, the fear chapter in my book, I had a client who was really experiencing a lot of doubt and hesitation at you know at moments of entry and and what we found or what, what we found after a couple of sessions was that it actually wasn't any inherent flaws or biases that he was bringing into that moment it was that he needed to systematize a bit more of his entry criteria and be clear about what he was exactly looking for because a lot of the doubts were legitimate they needed to be answered and once he spent the time actually doing that the fear didn't go away entirely, but he stopped being paralyzed enough to make the clear decision. I think one of the big misconceptions, right, is that, you know, you shouldn't have any nervousness or fear in trading. And that, that's not true. Now, some traders don't. And that, I'm not saying be fearful or, or have nervousness or anxiety, but you have to understand that you're, you're trading your own money most of the time. Or if you're in a prop firm, like you still care, like your, your goals, your dreams, your, you know, are on the line here. It, it's intense. And, you know, any professional industry, you know, brought in at this level has that kind of baked in intensity and, and to, to like remove that and to think that that should be gone um, is a misnomer. So anyway, so this particular client's, you know, uh, issues were a hundred percent due to his understanding of his strategy and system and it needed to be higher. You have to have a, a base level of skill. Uh, so yeah, just been kind of recent that a number of clients have been that way, but um yeah, for the most part, right? There's there's a a an inter intersection between um, your your skill and uh, as a trader and and your psychology and your skill has to be high enough in order to really expose the like weak points. I'd say the 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 access point for my client base and I think the people that have been successful in using my book is you have two, three, or four consistent trading mistakes that you you're making. Right. And and you can't stop yourself from making them. You know that you should hold longer. You know you shouldn't enter sooner. You know you shouldn't get pissed off and re-enter a position three times in a row. Right. You know these things, and yet you can't stop yourself from doing that. And all, 100 percent right. That is caused by having too much emotion in that moment. The emotion is creating some paralysis, you know, psychologically, mentally, that's not allowing you to think as clearly. And so we need to kind of debug the system and understand what's what's provoking that emotion and, and actually correct it, right? Correct the flaws, the biases, the wishes. And I've said that a few times. So let me give your, your listeners, a, you know, some examples like, you know, um, high expectations would be an example of that, right? I mean, high expectations are great for motivation, 
but they can create anger, loss of confidence, fear, overconfidence, um, hindsight bias, right? It's so easy in retrospect to know what you should have done. And you think, well, that shouldn't really create any problems in the next trade, but it actually is like implied overconfidence because you think that you can see easily what you should have done. That means I should be able to see easily what I should do next time. And it sets you up for the sort of false expectation because you're actually not that good, right? <laughs> you've you've learned, you, you've got to convert hindsight into foresight. And that's the challenge. Uh, another one is just being overly competitive or hating to lose or hating to make mistakes, right? These are kind of the things that run in the background of our minds that spark and create that emotion in real time. And it oftentimes can build too. So throughout the trading day, you can have more anger and frustration building to the point where you do something incredibly dumb, like, you know, blowing a prop account or blowing, you know, large amounts of money that uh, really can be, you know, debilitating for your your month or your your week. I think a lot of people want to know how do you sort of change your mindset or change the way you do things? Like you might be stuck in a cycle where you always like take profits too early or you always like take profits too late. So how do you kind of change that? Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not simple. And I, 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 I hope that, you know, people that kind of go through my material understand that while it may not be simple, it's not overly complicated either. It's not insurmountable. It just takes work and dedication and skill. You know, like you can't read a book, including mine. Well, you can't read it, let's say a, a physical fitness book and you have that give you muscles. You know, and I think sometimes people think you can read a book or watch a podcast like this and like have it give you the mindset you have. It can give you some inspiration and it can give you a feeling of opera, like, of of uh, positivity or uh you know the, the sense that you're going to be able to solve things but there's no way around doing the work so what's some of the basics of what that work includes number one you have to be collecting the data and details surrounding those mistakes and in particular catching the early warning signs so there's a worksheet that i you know talk about in the book it's freely available on my website it's called a data collection worksheet so you're, co you're actually like writing down what the mistake is. You're writing down your thoughts, uh, the changes in your behavior, your, your actions. You know, it could be like, you know, uh, staring at one chart or rapidly moving between multiple charts, uh, opening up <laughs> um, certain, uh, not positions, but uh, uh, indicators that you don't normally use. Uh, like kind of, anyway, looking at the changes in how your perception of the market might change. You know, you might be fearful at times when you ought not to be and, you know, really kind of doubting uh, what what might be some uh, physical signs. Like you get some heat in your head or tension in your hands, nervous in your, nervousness in your stomach. What that does is it helps to give you a bigger picture of what is happening. Okay, And when you do that repeatedly surrounding these mistakes, you start to develop a pattern. Right. And so the charting of your mental and emotional state ought to look like what, you know, charting looks like, you know, on an actual trading chart, right? You see the ups and downs that occur. And so you kind of do that as a starting point and then start to look retroactively as, as what were the warning signs before that? Can you find the deviation from an optimal mental state? So let's say, I mean, a lot of people start the trading day in a good frame of mind, but then very quickly, you know, the market goes against what their initial uh, bias was. Uh, or their initial thesis was and now they start to feel like they're on the back back foot and they can you know they're on twitter they're in a discord group and they see other people making money now they now the the feeling like oh like other people are making money the little fomo creeps up and so that first like kind of flash of uh, like oh shit, like i'm doing something wrong i'm not making money that's that's where the problem begins and then you know they don't let's say take a trade initially but now they start you know, what uh, messing around with their criteria in their mind, they try to start making some excuses about, you know, let's, let's say the beginnings of some bad behavior in terms of how they're thinking about positions, or maybe even opening some. And so that would be kind of like warning sign number two, still haven't made a mistake yet, you know, and then all of a sudden, uh, they get into a, a like, uh, uh, a position that is that meets their criteria, but gets stopped out, right. And so then, that, that's warning sign number three, because now it like triggers some anger along with some FOMO. And then they're going to rapidly enter a position using some of that uh, initial emotion that was built up in those first two points. 
you have to take action at those first two warning signs uh, in order to firmly be able to correct your problems. Because if you wait until the moments when you're actually most vulnerable to making those mistakes, it's very likely to be too far along. And the reason is because there is a fundamental law of human nature that everybody needs to know and burn into the inside of the brain. Okay. When the emotional system becomes overactive, it shuts down higher brain function. So you lose the ability to think, plan, make decisions, right? That, that whiteboard in your mind where you're actually thinking, right? It shrinks and then ultimately goes away if the emotions get high enough. But there's also like the, the emotional control is also a function, right? So your control of your emotions are in a part of the brain that's responsible uh, so that that, that uh, uh, can be shut down by your emotions. So your emotion has the power to shut down the part of the brain responsible for controlling it. So emotions are more powerful than the mind. You have to work around this reality. We can't come in the front door saying, you know, I'm going to think my way through this. And, and the best example of this for those uh, would be those moments where you know what you should be doing. You know, I've had clients who literally have both hands on their mouse, trying to get themselves to stop getting into a position and they can't stop themselves. Like, you know what you're doing is wrong. And like, there's this almost like out of body sense, like what, like, what is happening? I'm, I'm, I've lost control of my actions. And that's where you're at like level 80 to 90 out of a hundred, right? At, when you're at a hundred in terms of like your emotional scale, so to speak, that's when you're in like a blind panic, blind rage, Right. Your mind, your mind is like completely shut down. You know, even you, sometimes people talk about it as like a blackout. But when you're at 80 to 90, you're still aware of what's happening, but you have almost no control. So what I'm talking about is you've got to catch it early before you even get close to that. So you have full functioning of your brain, a right, full functioning of your mind to actually start to counteract those emotions. But to do that well, you really under, have to understand the causality. So step number one is to do what I call mapping, okay? So the data collection, you know, you do enough of that, you can turn it into a map that creates a scale of escalation from level one to 10 of your fear scale, or your FOMO scale, or your anger scale, right? And, and you're able to kind of chart how that uh, emotion increases so you can take action early. Once, But once you have that, it doesn't mean that you have the power of control, right? Awareness is just the first step. It's like the, if anybody watched GI Joe growing up, right? Knowing is half the battle. Okay, knowing is just half of it. The other half is understanding what is sparking that emotion so that you can actually correct it in the moment. And that, you know, what I call kind of getting to the root of your problem is a more complicated uh, step, but it's like what the majority of the book was designed to do is to help you kind of debug that part of it. Once you do that, step three is developing a real-time strategy where you're actually developing mental game strategy to counteract uh, those issues in the moment. So again, I'm kind of going very kind of high level, but, um, you know, this is not insurmountable. It can take a little bit of time to get there, but, but it's, it's doable. And, uh, you know, lots of clients and readers have done that. No, this is really well explained. And it kind of explains why a lot of people know how to trade. Like they know how all the steps, the analysis, the tools, but when it comes to placing trades, they just kind of do it. They just mess up. They make mistakes. So definitely a good point there. Yeah. Great. What about expectations? Can you change someone's expectations of trading? Like some people come in and they want to get rich. Is there something they can do to kind of go back on the right track or because it's really hard to convince someone that they have the wrong expectations? Well, you, you got to be open to wanting to change your, you know, I think that's the, the, the biggest thing, right? If, you know, I never kind of come in the front door and tell people like, you need to be thinking this way. It's more of a, of a, a reframing, you know, if you are, trying to get rich quick in trading, what is the difference between what you're doing and buying lottery tickets? What's the difference between you and, and going to the casino and trying to make a lot of money playing roulette or blackjack or craps? Like there is no difference. You're, you're gambling and that's fine. If that's what you choose to do, I'm, I'm in no position to say how you should spend your money, but I can tell you that a lot of my clients will be very happy to take your money. So, you know, the, the question is like, what is, what are your, what is your goal? If you are a trader your goal is not just to make money. That, that may be the, the headline, right? I want to make X amount this year, but your goals have to be much more rich and detailed in terms of, I want to uh, be a, like a dedicated professional 
that treats trading as seriously as professional athletes, which means that it is the center point of my life, right? I'm not saying that, you know, your family is less important than trading, but if you're going to be a high level professional, you know, you're waking up early, you're, you're going through, you know, your warm up, your routine, your process to get your mind, your body in a good position. You're doing the diligence with regards to, you know, your watch lists or, you know, looking at past trades, reviewing your, your journals, back testing, whatever you do to prepare yourself. Right. And then you have a process during the trading day to stay at a high level, not just, you know, avoiding the mistakes that we're talking about, but taking regular breaks, which most traders don't want to do. But look, no athlete is competing or training for eight hours straight without a break. So why would you expect yourself to sit down at 938, you know, Eastern and and trade till four o'clock without taking breaks? Like it's it's obscene and absurd, you know, and a lot of people, a lot of traders expect themselves to be able to have that kind of conditioning. Many of them don't, right? To be able to have high level focus and endurance for the entirety of the trading day, five days a week, get the F out of here. So there's that. And then there's the cool down process. Like, what are you doing afterwards? Then what's your study and work routine look like on the weekends? Like, I'm not saying that you have to do all of that, but if your goals are high to make a lot of money, you have to be treating this with the kind of respect that, you know, I think I use professional athletes a lot because it's it's just an easy construct for us to understand like what they go through, right? I mean, Jordan, LeBron James, Tiger Woods, you know, Ruffin and Nadal, like these guys aren't just showing up at, you know, five minutes before game time, before, you know, they're about to tee off and be like, all right, cool. Let's, let's go make some money today. Let's go win this event or win this match. Like they don't do that. They're, it's so traders by and large understand like really what's required, but they kind of wish that it was easy, which I would say is one of the inherent flaws in the back of your mind. That's really undermining your efforts. That's a good point. What would be your advice for someone who wants to scale up their trading? And they might be at a point where they have more capital to, to invest. They want to kind of grow that capital. They want to be able to trade with more, more size. How do they scale up? How do they go to these, these next levels? A lot of times it, it comes to having artificially small confidence. Um, there's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which says that people who have very little skill are oftentimes overconfident because they don't know how bad they are. And then you have people on the other side, which I think are in the category of these traders who have a lot of skill, but they undervalue what they know because they falsely assume that everybody else has it or everybody else is. So there's this like confidence is an emotion. It is not a fact. So your confidence is the emotion that reflects your perception of your skill. And if that perception is off, right, in terms of overestimating or underestimating, you're going to make bad decisions in both directions, but the but the lacking of confidence tends to create a lot of risk aversion, especially as you're you're scaling up. So you have to spend more time actually systematizing your own strategy, right? And a lot of times that is like a, a, a thing that traders just sort of aren't doing. They kind of know it because of the momentum of their day to day. But if I were to wake you up at four a.m. and say what is your, you know, what's your strategy? You got 30 seconds. Like, tell me how you make money. Like you might be able to get 80% of it. Correct. I'm not saying like, you don't know it at all, but the difference between the 80% and the hundred percent is the difference between having your confidence be like this versus like this, right. And having a firm base with which for you to scale up on, you're right. It's, it, you know, it's not just about having the capital to, to leverage. You need to have the, the foundation of your own confidence to be able to leverage and to be able to take take those losses and and to know that you can so systematizing your strategy a bit more you know taking time to really understand how you make money how you know i'm not saying that you have to be create an algo here but you're just going to have more clarity and i've had traders who you know even are like 15 to 20 years in who do this and it, it becomes a big catalyst for them making bigger bets so that's number one number two is just look for any other kind of flaws or biases that may you know exist here. All right. And if you are somebody with high expectations, you may have significantly undervalued your previous accomplishments. You know, your your previous right. It may you may feel like at any one point, like you, you know, you're gonna be broke again. Or maybe you you busted a couple accounts, you know, five years ago. And the the threat of that kind of still looms in the back of your mind. So you've got these ghosts that you kind of have to get rid of. And, and to prove like, oh, listen, 
I am actually good at this. And to feel that way, you know, oftentimes comes by recognizing your past accomplishments that have gone unrecognized or, you know, like correcting some of the, the, the ghosts or, or trauma points, uh, you know, in the back of your mind from past losses, mistakes, et cetera. What about traders who feel like they, like they want to be more discretionary. They don't want to be more systematized. They feel like having a process would actually hurt their trading. Every trader still has a system, um, in a process for making decisions. Um, so, you know, for you, maybe you don't want to get to a hundred percent, but you need to get from 60 to 80% or you get need to get from 80 to 85, right? It, there's still like an algo in your mind. There's still a decision tree in your mind. There's still, you know, indicators that you're using and there's comprehension of those indicators. And there's an understanding of like, why you're using it here versus there or how, you know, they interact with each other at different points of the market. There's, there's just not, so like you, you could also just look back at, you know, the last, the last hundred trades that you've taken and, and observe them and just like kind of soak them in and see what sort of sticks in your mind. Like I'm, I've, there's a lot of traders who are more kind of feel based and intuitive, but you have to understand that your intuition does not just like come out of nothing, right? It, it It's, based off of a lot of knowledge and experience, which is why, you know, I think any trader with less than a one year of experience, they should not be relying on their intuition at all, right? You you might make an intuitive trade based on trends in the market. Like, uh, you know, you, you've got, let's say a 13 year old daughter who loves this brand. This brand is going to have, going to have an IPO, like you see the opportunity there because of your knowledge of things that are not trading based, they're just more market based. Cool. Yeah. You can have intuition there, but from a trading standpoint where you're making three, four, let's say trades per day or per week, like that requires a lot of knowledge and skill. And, and, and that's something that can be more systematized. You can kind of defragment your knowledge base in a sense and kind of get rid of things that used to guide your decision-making because in the back of your mind, there's always this sort of trailing edge to our knowledge. I would call it C game, right? And so when you become emotional, we kind of revert back to making more of those C game based decisions. And for more experienced traders, that cannot be caused by big like mental and emotional flaws. It can be caused very simply by having outdated knowledge still in the back of your mind that hasn't been kind of ruled out as like, no, no, that shit's old. It's not part of how I trade anymore. And so your intuition, right, as the trader we were just talking about now, your intuition could still be guided by that if you're not razor sharp. Or, you know, you could just spend some time looking at it and say, no, that's no longer relevant. And now all of a sudden you're going to sort of free yourself up to be more intuitive because you know that there's going to be less noise in the back of your mind interfering with your decisions. So we, we tend to pick up some things over the years that don't necessarily work or don't serve us well in the future. So yeah, that's a good point for sure. Yeah. Get rid of them. So tell me a bit more about personality. I feel like people either place too much emphasis or not enough on personality and like what they're best at trading or what's best for them in trading. Can you tell me more about kind of how that impacts their, their trading performance? I'll, I'll be honest. I don't get a ton into personality because I, I tend to kind of look at like what somebody brings and brings to the table. And that tends to not have to do entirely with, with their personality, like the flaws, the biases, the wishes, the illusions, the problems that they experience. And on the flip side, like what does it take for them to be great? You know, their motivations, their routines, their structure, their discipline, things like that. You know, there are trends within personality, but there's not causality. And I, I really, I want causality because that's where you can generate predictability. However, um, what I would say is that personality, I think, tends to be the most impactful in the finding of your niche and, and your style as a trader. And so it's important to understand your own personality and understand that your personality can evolve and change over time. Right? And, and so your strategy and style really needs to kind of match that. Otherwise, there's going to be some friction and noise and uh, it's going to make trading harder for you. But again, I don't spend a ton of time doing that because I don't have enough knowledge as a trader to be able to do that well. But I know that there are other you know, professionals in the space that do. I know one thing you spend a lot of time talking about too is the, the review process, being able to review performance, your trades, 
kind of categorizing them correctly. Uh, can you kind of go more over this and how, how do you actually kind of use your past results to become better? I think the easiest way to look at it is like every single trading day is like taking a test. Some traders are taking open book exams. Like if you go back to school, you know, we all kind of would have those times where the teacher didn't really care that you had it in, in your mind. Like they wanted you to be able to know how to research it and access the information. But if you're taking an open book test, right, that knowledge is not as internalized as you'd ideally want it to be, right? For, certainly as a trader. So what we want is, um, you know, to be able to like get a clean test. And then at the end, you got to grade the test. And the test can include also kind of how you perform mentally and emotionally, right? This isn't just a test of your trading prowess. It's the test of your entire, you know, uh, like trading business. Like how did it perform today? And if you don't go through a thorough review process, you're just going to walk away with an idea. And ideas are fine. Ideas aren't bad. Ideas are better than just like walking away and not thinking about it at all. But I think if you have a thorough review process that really looks specifically at you know, your mistakes, your successful trades. I don't care about, uh, and if you're, if you're a trader taking, you know, 30 to 40 trades an hour, right. Scalpers, high frequency, like, you know, I understand you can look more at like kind of the data and not every individual trade, but if you're trading, you know, four to five times a day, you know, obviously, you know, three to five times a week, right. You've got plenty of time to really like look at the chart and, and analyze it with, with a lot of diligence but also like really analyzing, you know, kind of the mentality that you brought uh, and and potential mistakes that were, were present. Um, that's how you can develop the trends that can then feed into the adaptations and changes you're making or your attempts at that. And then if you're unable to fix it, my, my general kind of uh, frame here is, especially mentally and emotionally, if you, if you attempt to correct something and within one or two weeks, you make no real material changes, then it, it it means you do not understand this problem well enough and your review process has not been thorough enough. You need to really take a step back and provide yourself more time to do a deeper analysis. And that can include trading mistakes too, right? You, you think you understand this particular setup, but it just kind of keeps failing. And maybe it's because the market's changed or maybe because uh, you know the, there's just something slight that has changed about the market or that there's something missing that you're able to access when you're in a better mental state that you can see that you're not able to access when you're in like a more normal B game state. So that review process, I think is essential for kind of keeping the whole train running. And I would, I would argue that uh, the five, 10, 20 minutes of time that you spend doing that as soon as the trading day ends for you. Okay. Now you want to have a five minute break because you're tired. Fine. But do not do this like hours later or even the next morning because there's so much data that you like kind of lose. So the five, 10, 20 minutes of time that you spend, I think is the most valuable time that you spend as a trader, not actually trading. Right? It's, it's just, it's so essential because every athlete, right? That's how they accelerate their growth process. It's by looking specifically at where, what they did well and what they did, what they did poorly, you know, and they're in between. And, and, you know, having that feed into everything that they then do, because if you're doing something really well for a, a, a period of time, like you can stop thinking about it. And, and that's how you can use the bandwidth of your mind more efficiently because you don't have unlimited resources. Something I remember I, sh I shared from your book that it's pretty good. And I would like you to explain on this maybe a little bit more. It's like, the, what's the difference between the A game, the B game, and I guess the C game? How do you kind of differentiate that? Yeah, same kind of thing as like what I was talking about with the mapping process. The mapping is like kind of very granular in that like we're getting into one particular problem and really seeing the escalation of it or how it kind of fits within that that pattern. The A game, B game, C game really take, kind of takes a farther step back and says, over the last three months, what does it look like when I'm at my best, you know, A game? What does it look like when I'm at my worst, C game? And then what does it look like when I'm kind of trading at my average level, which would be B game? And what you generally see is a bell curve, right? There's going to be a lower frequency of A game, lower frequency of C game, higher frequency of B game. Now, it can be skewed kind of right or left. If you're trading really well, then, you know, yeah, there might be more frequency of, of A game than there is C game. But the bottom line is, like, it's really, really hard to be at an A game level mentally and psychologically uh, for a long period of time. Um, you know, I'd say, you know, the zone... Right, would be kind of the peak would be kind of the fourth category here and 
on average, I'd say over, over that kind of sample, if you can be in the zone, like six to 12% of the time, like you're world-class. Okay. If you're in your a game, 30 to 40, 50%, you're world-class, right? So we're really trying to reduce the frequency of C game down to as low as possible, but it's unavoidable, right? Even if you continue to progress, like you're always going to have a C game. You're always going to have weaknesses, right? The best traders in the world, they still make mistakes. They still have weak points. Those weak points are, you know, measurably better than your best right now, but okay, fine. That's your reality. That's what you're chasing. But the point is nobody is perfect. Nobody has solved their own mind or solved trading. Now, again, if you're an algo trader, a little bit different, right? Or if you were highly systematized, right? You're making no discretionary decisions. Then yes, like your A game is going to look a little bit different than somebody that, you know, is making more discretion, um, more discretionary decisions. But bottom line is like, as human beings, we have variability inter internally, and that's a large part of what creates that the, the, the deviation between kind of A, B, and C. That's a very good point. How would you describe a good trade? Well, one that is well executed, right? I mean, and that it's, you know, you don't have full control of the outcomes. Um, so any trade has the probability that it has. Uh, you know, defined by your strategy. A good trade is one that you had defined ahead of time or included enough intuition where it was accurately deviated from to create, you know, an even better entry or exit or scaled up or leveraged up, um, but was was well executed as defined by you. I want to take your time, Jared, but can you tell people where they can learn more about you and kind of find out more about what you do? Yeah, uh, so jaredtendler.com uh, is my website. Uh, information on my coaching. Uh, I've got a new program coming out in um, October. So that the information on that as well. Uh, it's called the Mental Game of Trading Live. Um, and of course, you know, the book is Mental Game of Trading uh, is available everywhere. Uh, you know, audiobook, ebook, soft cover, hard cover. Um, and also on the website, jaredtundler.com is uh, a lot of those worksheets. I alluded to that earlier. There's, I don't even know how many there are now. I kind of keep adding to it. But basically, it's they're all freely available, uh, you know, to download. Um, and there's also a free intuition ebook. So if you want to learn more about intuition and how to kind of cultivate it, leverage it more, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about it, uh, that, that ebook is free, but freely available on the website as well. Uh, I'm also fairly active on Twitter. Summer's been a little bit busy. I've been playing a little bit more golf and trying to play some big tournaments again. So, but I'm, I'm, you know, fairly active on Twitter as well, uh, at Jared Tendler. Yeah, definitely a lot in your book that people can take away from. And something that I kind of try to go back to read it a few times too. Uh, it's a good book for this and you can have learned a lot, a lot of stuff. You always pick up some new stuff along the way too, which is cool. And I'll definitely put those things below for you to check them out and, and go there and connect with you. Awesome. Appreciate it. So Jared, I appreciate it. I appreciate your time as always. And hopefully you can catch up pretty soon discussing again. But that was a really good, good discussion here. I appreciate it.